The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. The morning of June 27th was clear and sunny with the fresh warmth of a full summer day. The flowers were blossoming profusely and the grass was richly green. The people of the village began to gather in the square between the post office and the bank around 10 o'clock. In some towns there were so many people that the lottery took two days and had to be started on June 26th. But in this village, where there was only about 300 people, the whole lottery took only about two hours, so it could begin at 10 o'clock in the morning and still be through in time to allow the villagers to get home for noon dinner. The children assembled first, of course. School was recently over for the summer, and the feeling of liberty sat uneasily on most of them. They tended to gather together quietly for a while before they broke into boisterous play, and their talk was still of classrooms and the teacher, of books and of reprimands. Bobby Martin had already stuffed his pockets full of stones, and the other boys soon followed his example, selecting the smoothest and the roundest stones. Bobby and Harry Jones and Dickie Delacroix, the villagers pronounced this name Delacroix, eventually made a great pile of stones in one corner of the square and guarded it against the rage of the other boys. The girls stood aside talking amongst themselves, looking over their shoulders at the boys and the very small children rolled in the dust or clung to the hands of their older brothers or sisters. Soon the men began to gather, surveying their own children, speaking of planting and rain and tractors and taxes. They stood together away from the pile of stones in the corner, and their jokes were quiet and they smiled rather than laughed. The woman, wearing faded house dresses and sweaters, came shortly after their men folk. They greeted one another and exchanged bits of gossip as they went to join their husbands. Soon the woman standing by their husbands began to call for the children and the children came reluctantly, having to be called about four or five times. Bobby Martin ducked under his mother's grasping hand and ran back laughing to the pile of stones. His father spoke up sharply and Bobby came and took, a, took his place between his father and his oldest brother. The lottery was conducted as were the square dances, the teen club, the Halloween program by Mr. Summers, who had the time and energy to devote to civic activities. He was a round-faced, jovial man, and he ran the coal business, and people were sorry for him because he had no children and his wife was kind of a scold. When he arrived at the square carrying the black wooden box, a murmur of conversation among the villagers came about, and he waved and called, a little late today, folks. The postmaster, Mr. Grays, followed him, carrying a three-legged stool, and the stool was put in the center of the square, and Mr. Summers set the black box down upon it. The villagers kept their distance, leaving a space between themselves and the stool when Mr. Summers said, some of you fellas want to give me a hand? There was a hesitation, but two men, Mr. Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, came forward to hold the box steady on the stool while Mr. Summers stirred up the papers inside of it. The original paraphernalia for the lottery had been lost long ago, and the black box was now resting on the stool that had been put to use even before old man Warner, the oldest man in town, was born. Mr. Summers spoke frequently to the villagers about making a new box but no one liked to upset even as much tradition was represented by the black box. There was a story that the present box had been made with some pieces of the box that preceded it, the one that had been constructed when the first people settled down to make a village here. Every year after the lottery, Mr. Summers began talking about a new box, but every year the subject was allowed to fade off without anything being done. The black box grew shabbier every year. By now it was no longer completely black, but splintered badly along one side to show the original wood color. And in some places it was faded or stained. 
Mr. Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, held the black box securely on the stool until Mr. Summers had stirred the papers thoroughly with his hand. Because so much of the ritual had been forgotten or discarded, Mr. Summers had been successful in having slips of paper substituted for the chips of wood that had been used for generations. Chips of wood, Mr. Summers had argued, had been very well when the village was tiny, but now the population was more than 300 and likely to keep growing. It was necessary to use something that would fit more easily into the black box. The night before the lottery, Mr. Summers and Mr. Graves made up the slips of paper and put them into the box, and it was taken to the safe of Mr. Summers' coal company and locked up until Mr. Summers was ready to take it to the square the next morning. The rest of the year, the black box was put away, sometimes one place and sometimes another. It had spent a year in Mr. Graves' barn and another year underfoot the post office, and sometimes it was set on the shelf in Mr. Martin's grocery store and left there. There was a great deal of fussing to be done before Mr. S uh, before Mr. Summers declared the lottery to be open. There was a list to make up the heads of families, heads of households in each family, members of each household in each family. There was the proper swearing in of Mr. Summers by the postmaster as the official of the lottery. And at one time, some people remembered, there had been a recital of some sort performed by the official of the lottery. A perfunctory, tuneless chant that had been rattled off duly every year. Some people believed that the official of the lottery used to stand just so when he said or sang it Others believed that he was supposed to walk among the people. But years and years ago, this part of the ritual had been allowed to lapse. There had been also a ritual salute, which the official of the lottery had had to use in addressing each person who came up to draw from the box. But this also changed with time. Until now, it was felt necessary only for the official to speak to each person approaching. Mr. Summers was very good at all this in his clean white shirt and blue jeans with one hand resting carelessly on the black box. He seemed very proper and important as he talked interminably to Mr. Graves and the Martins. Just as Mr. Summers finally left off talking and turned to the assembled villagers, Mrs. Hutchinson came hurriedly along the path to the square, her sweater thrown over her shoulders and slid into place in the back of the crowd Clean forgot what day it was, she said to Mrs. Delacroix, De De who stood next to her, and they both laughed softly. Thought my old man was out back stacking wood, Mrs. Hutchinson went on. And then I looked out the window and the kids was gone and I remembered it was the 27th, so I came a running. She dried her hands off on her apron, and Mrs. Delacroix said, Oh, you're still in time though. They're just talking away up there. Mrs. Hutchinson craned her neck through the crowd and found her husband standing near the front. She tapped Mrs. Delacroix, Delacroix on the arm as a farewell and began to make her way through the crowd. The people separated good-humoredly to let her through. Two or three people said, in voices just loud enough to be heard across, uh, across the crowd, here comes your Mrs. Hutchinson and Bill, she made it after all. Mrs. Hutchinson reached her husband, Mr. Summers, who had been waiting ch and, and said cheerfully, Thought we was going to have to get on without you, Tessie. Mrs. Hutchinson said, grinning, Wouldn't have had me leave my dishes in the sink now, would you, Joe? And a soft laughter ran through the crowd as people stirred back into position after Mrs. Hutchinson's arrival. Well now, Mr. Summers said soberly, Guess we better get started. Guess we better get this over with so we can get back to work. Anybody ain't here? Dunbar, several people said. Dunbar, Dunbar. Mr. Summers consulted his list. Clyde Dunbar, he said. That's right, he's broke his leg, ain't he? Who's drawing for him? Me, I guess, a woman said. And Mr. Summers turned to look at her. Wife draws for husband, Mr. Summers said. Don't you have a grown boy to do it for you, Janie? Although Mr. Summers and everyone else in the village knew the answer perfectly well, it was the business of the official of the lottery to ask such questions formally. Mr. Summers waited with an expression of polite interest while Mrs. Dunbar answered. 
florist is not 16 yet, Mrs. Dunbar said regretfully. Guess I gotta fill in for the old man this year. Right, Mr. Summers said. He made a note on the list he was holding, and then he asked, Watson boy drawn this year? A tall boy in the crowd raised his hand. Here, he said. I'm drawing for my mother and me. He blinked his eyes nervously and ducked his head as several voices in the crowd said things like, good feller, Jack, and glad to see your mother's got a man to do it. Well, Mr. Summers said, guess that's everyone. Old man Warner make it. Yep, a voice said, and Mr. Summers nodded. A sudden hush fell on the crowd as Mr. Summers cleared his throat and looked at the list. All ready, he called. Now, I'll read the names of the heads of families first, and then the men come up and take a paper out the box. Keep the paper folded in your hand without looking at it until everyone's had a turn. Is that clear? The people had done it so many times that they only half listened to the directions. Most of them were quiet, wetting their lips, not looking around. Then Mr. Summers raised one hand high and said, Adams. A man disengaged himself from the crowd and came forward. Hi, Steve, Mr. Summers said. And Mr. Adams said, Hi, Joe. They grinned at one another humorlessly and nervously. Then Mr. Adams reached into the black box and took out a folded paper. He held it firmly by one corner as he turned and went hastily back into the crowd where he stood a little apart from his family, not looking down at his hand. Allen, Mr. Summers said. Anderson, Bentham. Seems like there's no time at all between lotteries anymore, Mrs. Delacroix said to Mrs. Graves in the back row. Seems like we only got through with the last one last week. Time sure does go fast, Mrs. Graves said. Clark, Delacroix. There goes my old man, Mrs. Delacroix said. She held her breath while her husband went forward. Dunbar, Mr. Summers said. And Mrs. Dunbar went steadily to the box while one of the women said, Gone, Janie. And another said, There she goes. We're next, Mrs. Graves said. She watched while Mr. Graves came around from the side of the box, greeted Mr. Summers gravely, and selected a slip of paper from the box. By now, all through the crowd, there were men holding small folded papers in their large hands, turning them over and over, nervously. Mrs. Dunbar had her and her two sons stood together, Mrs. Dunbar holding the slip of paper. Harbert, Hutchinson, get on up there, Bill, Mrs. Hutchinson said, and the people near her laughed. They do say, Mr. Adams said to old man Warner, who stood next to him. That over in the North Village, they're talking about giving up the lottery. Old man Warner snorted. Pack of crazy fools, he said. Listen to the young folks, nothing's good enough for them. Next thing you know, they'll be wanting to go back to living in caves. Nobody work anymore. Live that way for a while. Used to be a saying about lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. First thing you know, we'd all be eating stewed chickweed and acorns. There's always been a lottery, he added petulantly. Bad enough to see young Joe Summers up there joking with everybody. Some places have already quit their lotteries, Mrs. Adams said. Nothing but trouble in that, old man Warner said stoutly. Pack of young fools. Martin and Bobby Martin watched his father go forward. Overdyck, Percy. I wish they'd hurry, Mrs. Dunbar said to her older son. I wish they'd hurry. They're almost through though, her son said. You get ready to run and tell dad, Mrs. Dunbar said. Mr. Summers called his own name and then stepped forward precisely and selected a slip from the box. Then he called Warner. 77th year I've been in the lottery. Old man Warner said as he went through the crowd. 77th time. 
Watson. The tall boy came awkwardly through the crowd. Someone said, don't be nervous, Jack. And Mr. Summer said, take your time, son. Zanini. And after that, there was a long, breathless pause until Mr. Summers, holding his slip of paper in the air, said, All right, fellas. For a minute or two, no one moved, and then all the slips of paper were opened. Suddenly, all the women began to speak at once, saying, Who is it? Who's got it? Is it the Dunbars? Is it the Watsons? Then the voices began to say, It's Hutchinson. It's Bill. Bill Hutchinson's got it. Go tell your father. Mrs. Dunbar said to her older son. People began looking around to see the Hutchinsons. Bill Hutchinson was standing quiet, staring down at the paper in his hand. Suddenly, Tessie Hutchinson shouted to Mr. Summers. You didn't give him enough time to get the paper he wanted. I saw you, it wasn't fair. Be a good sport, Tessie, Mrs. Delacroix called and Mrs. Graves said, all of us took the same chance. Shut up, Tessie, Bill Hutchinson said. Well, everyone, Mr. Summers said, that was done pretty fast, and now we've got to get to hurrying a little bit more to get done in time. He consulted his next list. Bill, he said, you draw for the Hutchinson family. You got the other households in the Hutchinsons? There's Donna and Eva. Mrs. Hutchinson yelled. Make them take their chance. Daughters draw with their husbands' families, Tessie, Mr. Summers said gently. You know that as well as anyone else. It wasn't fair, Tessie said. I guess not, Joe, Bill Hutchinson said regretfully. My daughter draws with her husband's family and that's only fair. And I've got no other family except the kids. Then as far as drawing for families is concerned, it's you. Mr. H Summers said in explanation. And as far as drawing for household is concerned, that's you too, right? Right? How many kids, Bill? Mr. Summers asked formally. Three, Bill Hutchinson said. There's Bill Jr. and Nancy and little Dave and Tessie and me. All right then, Mr. Summers said. Harry, you got your tickets back? Mr. Graves nodded and held up the slips of paper. Put him in the box then, Mr. Summers directed. Take bills and put it in. I think we ought to start over, Mrs. Hutchinson said as quietly as she could. I tell you, it wasn't fair. You didn't give him enough time to choose and everybody saw that. Mr. Graves had selected five slips of paper and put them in the box and he dropped all the papers but those onto the ground where the breeze caught them and lifted them off. Listen, everybody, Mrs. Hutchinson was saying to the people around her. Ready, Bill? Mr. Summers asked. And Bill Hutchinson, with one quick glance around at his wife and children, nodded. Remember, Mr. Summers said, take the slips of paper and keep them folded until each person is taking one. Harry, you help little Dave. Mr. Graves had taken one hand of the little boy who came willingly with him up to the box. Take the paper out the box, Davy, Mr. Summers said. And Davy put his hand in the box and laughed. Take just one paper, Mr. Summers said. Harry, you hold it for him. Mr. Graves took the child's hand and removed the folded paper from the tight fist and held it while little Dave stood next to him and looked up at him wonderingly. Nancy next. Mr. Summers said. Nancy was 12 and her school friends breathed heavily as she went forward, switching her skirt and she took a slip daintily from the box. Bill Jr., Mr. Summers said, and Billy's, his red face and feet over large nearly knocked over the box as he got a paper out. Tessie, Mr. Summers said. She hesitated for a minute, looking around defiantly and then set her lips and went up to the box. She snatched out a paper and held it behind her. Bill, Mr. Summers said. And Bill Hutchinson reached into the box and felt around, bringing his hand out with the last slip of paper in it. The crowd was quiet. A girl whispered, 
I hope it's not Nancy. And the sound of the whisper reached the edges of the crowd. It's not the way it used to be, old man Warner said clearly. People ain't the way they used to be. All right, Mr. Summers said. Open the papers. Harry, you go on ahead and open little Dave's. Mr. Graves opened the slip of paper and there was a general sigh through the crowd as he held it up and everyone could see that it was blank. Nancy and Bill Jr. opened theirs at the same time. Both of them beamed and laughed, turning around to the crowd holding their slips of paper above their heads. Tessie, Mr. Summers said. And there was a pause. And then Mr. Summers looked at Bill Hutchinson and Bill unfolded his paper and showed it. It was blank. It's Tessie, Mr. Summers said, and his voice was hushed. Show us her paper, Bill. Bill Hutchinson went over to his wife and forced the slip of paper out of her hand. It had a little black spot on it, the black spot Mr. Summers had made the night before with a heavy pencil in the coal, company coal office. Bill Hutchinson held it up and there was a stir in the crowd. All right, folks, Mr. Summers said. Let's finish this here quickly. Although the villagers had forgotten the ritual and lost the original black box, they still remembered to use the stones. The pile of stones the boys had made earlier was ready. There were stones on the ground blowing in the scraps of paper that had come out of the box and Mrs. Delacroix selected a stone so large she had to pick it up with both hands and she turned to Mrs. Dunbar. Come on, she said, hurry up. Mrs. Dunbar had had the stones in both hands and she said, grasping for breath, I can't run at all, you go ahead and I'll catch up with you. The children had stones ready and someone gave little Davy Hutchinson a few pebbles. Tessie Hutchinson was in the center of a cleared space by now and she held her hands out desperately as the villagers moved in on her. It isn't fair, she said, and a stone hit her in the side of the head. Old man Warner was saying, come on, come on everyone. Steve Adams was in the front of the crowd of the villagers with Mrs. Graves beside him. It isn't fair, it isn't right, Mrs. Hutchinson screamed and then they were all upon her. Y'all, I, I think I have, might have had a little bit too much fun with that story, especially the uh, old man Warner role, but whatever, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, what I liked about it was this slow burn from these uh, smiles, these plastered fake smiles and laughs and everything like that. Uh, into this disgusting horror in this uh, village's tradition. Shirley Jackson, I am not sure that she would have liked this performance. She didn't grow up in the South like I did, but I was channeling how the story hit me. My experiences growing up in Alabama, small cities, small towns, um, and how the characters reminded me of people that I actually uh, met in real life. Curious, how did the story hit you? I would love to know about that. Uh, share it in the comments. It could be fun discussion. It could even result in a video uh, based on some of the thoughts that you share. So I uh, would love to see that. And uh, I mean, if you enjoyed the story and want to see more things like it, go ahead and subscribe. If you're interested in continuing down this kind of Southern Gothic pathway, by the way, uh, there's another story, Good Country People. I did a recording for that. Uh, and that would be a good progression, especially if you like that voice that I use right here. So hope you enjoy that and, uh, we'll see you next time.